Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you, Torben, and thanks for inviting me to Cambridge. Um, yeah, so I will talk about homomorphic encryption from ring learning with arrows. I'm going to explain what all these words mean. And I stated here that this is joint work with Christian and Brinard, which we did when we all were working at MSR Redmond in the crypto group. Um, I state I will be talking about joint work, but probably I won't get there in the time I have. So um, the main thing I want to do today is just introduce the scheme that we uh, implemented, um, which is basically a scheme uh, that Vinod and one of his co-authors uh, submitted to crypto uh, 2011 last year. So to in explain the first uh, word, homomorphic, oh, sorry, uh, just may maybe a first example for what you might have seen already, which is uh, the RSA crypto system. Um, which is widely used, and um, yeah, it, it, it's based more or less on the difficulty of factoring. So the public parameter here, n, is a product of two primes, two different primes, and you have a public key, which is this number, and some public exponent, uh, e, with certain properties, and then the secret key is the inverse of this modulo sum number. Uh, the, the most important thing I want to show you here is just how encryption works, which you might have seen before at some time. So if you take a message, which is a number modulo n, um, and you encrypt it, you, you then can encrypt it by just raising it to the public exponent modulo n. And decryption is the same operation, just using the, the private key, the, the secret key. Now, if you take two um, such ciphertexts and you multiply them together, modulo n, um, you get a multiplicatively homomorphic property. Yeah? You, you can see here, um, you can write it like the product of the messages raised to the eth power. So the product of two ciphertexts gives you a ciphertext of the product of the messages. Yeah? So that's multiplicative homomorphism. <clears throat> Now, a second example, um, also a fairly well-known protocol, is the Elgamal public key encryption. You can state that for a general group, a cyclic group G. Um, so here, the secret key is an exponent as well, and the public key is just this public generator of the group raised to that exponent. Of course, here, the security relies on that you cannot find out the, the exponent X from knowing the number h, or the group element h. Um, so encryption goes as follows. You choose a random exponent r, which is a number modulo the group order, and you kind of encode that randomness in the first part of the ciphertext. And then you encrypt a message by multiplying with a power of the public key. So now, this more or less has the same uh, outcome here. If you multiply component-wise two such ciphertexts like this, then in the first component, uh, you can write the, the product here as a g to the power of the sum of those random numbers. And then, again, the same thing happens. Uh, the product of the messages appears there. And this looks exactly like a ciphertext um, yeah, like this one, you replace R by the sum of R1 and R2, and then this is a ciphertext of the product of the messages. Yeah? So this also is a multiplicative homomorphism. You could imagine other crypto systems where, for example, you put the message in the exponent, and then the multiplication will give you the sum of the messages in the exponent. Yeah? So there are crypto systems that have multiplicative homomorphic properties, and others have uh, additive homomorphic properties. So there are a lot of these properties. Usually you want to avoid these properties. For example, in RSA, you would never use the version I showed you in the beginning. That's just the schoolbook version. Um, having this structure is dangerous. Having more structure is dangerous. You want to avoid this 
by some padding schemes, for example. Nevertheless, these uh, properties can be used as well. I mean, you can do computations under the encryption. You know? If you think of an additive homomorphic encryption scheme, you could uh, use that for evaluating elections, you know, where the votes are zeros and ones. You can add them up under the encryption. Uh, voters could encrypt their votes, and then you can add up and, in the end, count, uh, see what the sum is. Then you have counted the number of ones, and um, you can evaluate elections with that. So this is, might be useful, you know, although sometimes it's dangerous. On the other hand, it might be useful. But now most of these schemes only provide additive or multiplicative functionality. And yeah, if you have both of them, you could more or less do arbitrary computations, at least polynomial computations. Yeah. So there was uh, a system that was introduced in 2005 by Bonet, Go, and Nissim that achieved a first step into that direction of achieving arbitrary computations. Namely, uh, that scheme could do many additions and a single multiplication. Yeah. The problem was once you did that multiplication, you couldn't go back to that state so you could do more multiplication. So once you did a multiplication, you were done. So you had two different uh, kinds of ciphertext and you would move from one set to the other by applying this multiplication procedure. And now there's this notion of fully homomorphic encryption, which allows you to do really arbitrary computations. So if you can do bit additions and bit multiplications, you can build up any computation you like. And if a scheme satisfies this property, it's called fully homomorphic. Yeah. I think if you can do and and or gates, XOR, you can you can do everything, right? So that, that's meant by, I mean, if you have bit addition and bit multiplication, you can build up anything. Okay, so just a very general scenario. What would you want to do? That's not a, a particular application. It's just the general picture. So you would, a user would encrypt all its data before sending it somewhere. So if you think of the server as being in the cloud, you encrypt your data, whatever it is, and send it to the, to the cloud. And then you could ask the server to do operations, or the server could do operations on the, on the data without ever knowing the data. You could do encrypted search, for example, ask for something, get back an encrypted result um, yeah, of your search. You could evaluate statistics, compute means, and stuff like that. And then you get back encrypted results. Yes? What about special constants, like 1 and 0, 2? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Good question. Nigel, do you want to? <laughs> and then, so how many, how many times are you going to arrive and you could provide some number that you're going to encrypt for them? Uh, okay. Okay. So you want to encrypt it for the table? Ah, okay. And also, I mean, you could not encrypt it and use it in the computations as well, or you could encrypt it and use it. It depends on if you want to hide it or, or not. Well, I'm I think. Okay, so yeah, the server never sees the data. Whatever applications one might have in mind, um, the question that rises is does such a scheme exist? I told you there are many uh, homomorphic properties, but only uh, additive or multiplicative. And so the, and if it exists, is it efficient actually? So the answer to this, was, to this question was given in, given in 2009 when Craig Gentry introduced uh, the first fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, and this is based on something called ideal lattices. So the general construction is uh, as follows. So at the core of this uh, encryption scheme, there's a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. That's something that can do a bit more than 
the, the, the schemes I've, I've uh, talked about before. It can do some additions and some multiplications. Uh, so it can evaluate certain low degree polynomials. Um, and then from this somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme, um, he builds up the fully homomorphic scheme. Um, so the general principle is that ciphertexts usually are noisy. Um, so the, the, the encryption is done by adding some noise to certain structures. <clears throat> so ciphertext is a, is a noisy um, thing, and if you do those operations, addition and multiplication, then the noise grows. Uh, so what basically happens, which we will see in the scheme in a few moments, is when you add something, the noise adds up. If you multiply something, the noise multiplies. So, of course, then in the end, you'll end up somewhere sinking in the, in the noise, in the waste. Yeah? So you have to pull yourself up out of the, the mud here. And that's done by something called a bootstrapping step, um, where such ciphertext can be refreshed. That is, you can remove the noise. Um, and this is, yeah, in, in his uh, suggestion done by um, yeah, homomorphically decrypting um, a ciphertext. So you could think of this as you, you encrypt it again and you get an encryption of the secret key. And then inside the new encryption, you will un, so decrypt uh, the old uh, encryption, remove by that decryption process, of course, the noise that's in the ciphertext. So you get a new uh, ciphertext with a new small noise um, from, from that new encryption. So that's basically the, the main idea. The problem is the decryption circuit is usually too difficult for the scheme to evaluate. <laughs> and there are some ways of yeah, making it work. So you have to add some more uh, um, assumptions. You have to squash the decryption circuit, yeah? for example, by distributing the, the secret key somehow. And, um, well, yeah. So, so far, this is quite inefficient. Uh, Nigel has some news probably that he didn't want to tell me before, but so maybe there is some progress, but in general, it's uh, very inefficient. Also, this uh, is kind of very old numbers in the sense of, uh, yeah, the fast-moving target here, fully homomorphic encryption. So last year, a, there was a paper by Gentry and Halevi where they implemented more or less the, the original scheme. Um, and you can see it takes some time. Yeah? So for crypto, this is amazingly slow. This is very slow. Yeah? So for example, if you look here, that's a, just a toy setting that doesn't guarantee any security. And it already takes six seconds to clean up a ciphertext that encrypts one bit. Yeah? And the public key is kind of large. Um, and then this large setting, it takes uh, half an hour to, it took half an hour at that time to, to clean up uh, such a ciphertext. And even, I mean, if you look at the large setting, I think there have been some results that state that this is not even an intermediate level of security right now. So there's not even 128 bits of security, probably these uh, parameters that are in the large setting. So there's a long way to go from there to really using homomorphic encryption. So there, are, there have been a, a few new variants that mostly follow the scheme. There has been some alteration lately, so things, people might get rid of this bootstrapping step or do it in a different way or just use it for uh, yeah, improving properties later on. And there are some uh, variants that are based on these kind of new assumptions for cryptography, the, the learning with errors problem and the ring learning with errors problem. Um, and also there's a point that you might not even need fully homomorphic encryption. If you have a specific application in mind, you probably have a specific set of functions you want to compute, or just maybe just one function. Or, uh, so you certainly have an upper bound on the, on the degree of polynomials you want to evaluate. So there, you, you don't really have to do fully homomorphic encryption. It would be okay to have a somewhat homomorphic scheme or an almost fully homomorphic uh, scheme somehow that can do what you want to do. Yeah? And here I just want to focus on that one scheme by Brokersky and Vaikuntanathan from last year's crypto. And just want to uh, 
show you how that works. Okay, so. Yeah, you have to care. Uh, nevertheless, you still have to care about the noise, but it works without the refreshing step. So the noise never gets too large. Does affect Yeah, it does still, but not in the way that you have to do the. Um, it, it of, of course it, it uh, affects the computations in the sense that they get slower. We will see uh, uh, later. So this is the learning with errors problem. So if you plug in Q equals two, um, some people might kn know this as the learning parity with noise problem. Yeah? So for, that's just a generalization. So if you take Q equals two and this probability distribution just a probability for getting a zero or a one, then this is exactly the learning parity with noise problem. So this is a bit more general. You have some dimension, you have a modulus Q and some probability distribution, usually something centered at zero. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the problem is to distinguish uh, the following two distributions of pairs. So a pair is a vector of dimension n and a number, so here a modulo q. Yeah? So the first distribution you have is the uniform distribution, which you get by just simply uh, selecting uniformly at random n plus one coefficients and you put in the vector here and, and the number there. The second distribution is the LWE, the learning with errors distribution, which works as follows. You draw a vector uniformly at random, which is kind of your secret. Yeah? So this is a fixed vector. And then to produce samples, you sample uh, a uniformly at random vector AI. And also you sample a small error according to, the, to this distribution here. I mean, it doesn't say it's small here, but in the end it will be some kind of small noise. And then what you put out as a sample is the pair AI, BI, where BI is this noisy inner product. Now, so you compute the inner product of AI with S and add this noise. So the task in this problem is to distinguish between the uniform and the LWE distribution. So this problem has been introduced to cryptography in 2005 um, by Regev. And his, in his paper, he, he shows some yeah, reductions of, of certain shortest vector problems, closest vector problems to the LWE problem. Now, so shortest vector problems on lattices are considered hard. Um, the point here is you have some approximate version. You're not looking for the really for the shortest vector. It suffices to have some a, a vector that is um, within some constant uh, times the shortest vector. And uh, the interesting thing is that the first reduction algorithm was a quantum reduction. So the algorithm that does the reduction is a quantum algorithm. Um, that has been, yeah, Pikert in 2009 gave a, a classical algorithm. Um, and the an very essential thing that goes into these proofs to show security, or to show that this problem helps you solve shortest vector problems, uh, is that you choose these distributions as discrete Gaussian distributions. Yeah? So I've put two pictures here. That's a two-dimensional one and one-dimensional. That's just a standard Gaussian rounded, for example, yeah? and taken modulo, the modulus Q. And now for the ring learning with arrows problem. It looks very similar. It's, it's a slight variation. And the point in doing the ring learning with arrows is just efficiency. Yeah? You get like a factor of n for the size of elements. Um, and there's a very efficient arithmetic to do computations here. So that's the setting of the scheme I want to describe. So here in this special case, we take n a power of two, and we have a polynomial, which is x to the n plus one. This is the two n cyclotomic polynomial. In the end, we want to compute modulo this. So we have a ring, we take integer polynomials in x, modulo this uh, f. So we replace any power x to the n by minus one. Um, and if you 
take this setting here, you have very efficient arithmetic. You can use discrete Fourier transforms because you have the roots of unity inside here. Uh, I mean, inside here. You, you know. So you have to choose the prime Q, uh, 1 modulo 2n, and then you can do everything you know from complex uh, Fourier transforms you can do in that structure as well. Okay, so this ring RQ, that's the ring we are going to work with. So elements from here will replace the vectors in the LWE problem, uh, as we've seen before. So these are just polynomials of degree at most n minus 1. And the coefficients are taken modulo Q. So now we can formulate the ring learning with arrows problem. It looks more or less the same. We just replace a few things here. So the, the pairs we look at are now two elements from that ring, so two polynomials. Uh, not a vector and a number anymore, two polynomials here. And then the uniform distribution. So we, again, we have to distinguish between two distributions, and the uniform distribution is just taking two n coefficients uniformly at random. That gives you two polynomials here. And the, the ring learning with arrows distribution looks exactly the same. We just replace the vector by a polynomial. The same here for the uniformly at random, the chosen polynomial. And then the error, of it, uh, yeah, the error, which was a number before, now is a polynomial as well. And then the second entry here, bi, you get by taking the ring product. So that's, that's just multiplication of polynomials. And then reducing modulo q, the coefficients, and reducing modulo x to the n plus 1, the degree, to get uh, a polynomial which has degree less than n again. Now we'll see an example soon. So now we have noisy ring products uh, of random elements with this secret s. So what that really does is it gives you n of these samples at once, um, like we had before in the standard learning with arrows except that now you have more structure. Those are not n independent samples. Kind of, you get these n samples by uh, rotating one of the vectors in some way. Yeah? So here's an example. So let's, for, for this talk, let's take uh, k equals 3. So this is extremely toy. It doesn't even work. Yeah? It, and it's it, definitely not secure. Um, but for the purpose of seeing what the operations look like, that's, that's great. So k equals 3, then we have uh, x to the 8 plus 1, and we take q, the prime uh, 97. So how does a typical element look like? It looks like this. Yeah? So it has degree at most uh, 7, and it has coefficients uh, modulo 97, which I wrote in a symmetric representation between uh, minus uh, q half and 2 q, uh, plus q half. Um, and then we'll take as the, the error distribution some, some discrete Gaussian, which we also sample coefficient-wise. So these error polynomials are somewhat small. They have small coefficients around zero. Yeah? Some of them are zero. Here they are at most uh, two. So this is a small element. Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have something which has a degree. So in that, in that case, this division can be simplified by just replacing x to the 8 by minus 1. Oh, really? Yes. That's, is this a special case because of it has this form? Well, yeah, that, yeah, of course. But if you have a more general polynomial, you can also replace x to the 8 by minus the rest of the polynomial. Yeah? Um, so now you can add these polynomials, of course, as you know. Uh, how to add polynomials? You just add them coefficient-wise. Yeah? So if we take a plus e here, so we get the 27. There's no x to the 7 here. And then the minus 11 minus 2 gets you the minus 13. Um, so you add coefficient-wise the polynomials. Uh, so if you do twice a, a plus a, you get 54, which is the same modulo 97 as minus 43. So I always write it in a symmetric representation. 
and so on. You can check that this is the sum of A with itself. And if you do multiplication, now here I only do, as an example, multiplication with X. So if you take that A, multiply it with X, you get this. Uh, every monomial raises its power by 1. And then you replace the x to the 8 by minus 1. So the 27 goes here, minus 27. So this is the result of multiplying by x. So that's a, yeah, that's a shift and where you put a minus at the things that go out on the left and come back on the right. Yeah. When you say symmetric representation, do you mean that of the two around 0, you always choose the one that has the smaller distribution? Exactly, yeah. Oh, so. The other way would be to represent numbers modulo q between 0 and q minus 1. Mm -hmm. But it's important to do it in that symmetric way here. Um, yeah, we'll see on the, in one of the next slides. OK, so that's how we compute. Yeah? So if you have a more complicated polynomial here that goes the same, you can split it off into the multiplications by these monomials, shift them around, and, and so on. OK, so it, when people started using this, uh, this problem was believed to be as hard as the general LWE problem. Of course, that, uh, there must be some problem here because there's a lot, of, a lot more structure. As I said, you don't just get an independent LWE samples. You get some that depend on each other. So there, there is some structure. There has been a paper recently that claims some linear in N speed up. So we have to be careful here. It, it, it's more efficient, but on the other hand, it's, it's probably less, it's less secure than using the standard learning with errors problem. But I mean, it is more efficient. So for now, let's uh, look at this. Um, yeah, and we have smaller keys here. So now let's look at the, at the scheme. Oh, no, <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah, maybe I'll go a bit quicker here. These are just two points to say we can replace, remember that secret S, uh, we can replace that by a small element as well. We don't need to have it uniformly random um, because this computation shows uh, that you can basically, if you have a, a general sample uh, with an invertible A0, you can transform any other coming sample into one that looks like a sample where it has a small error at this place where the S was before. So that means there's no point. You, you don't have to take all the randomness into that S. It's, it's OK to have a small element here. And also you can, what's also OK is to have small multiples of errors before you add, add this noise. Yeah? So you could think of taking only even coefficients um, here. OK, so talking about even coefficients modulo Q is a bit strange. And that's the reason we need to have that symmetric representation. I'll come to that in a minute. So now, how does the scheme look like? So the point is, the problem, if you cannot solve the problem, then to you, these samples from the learning with errors distribution look basically the same as random. Yeah? So they are indistinguishable from random. You can use these to hide something. So what you do here is, for the key generation, so you have this small secret, uh, and you basically sample one of these uh, LWE samples, which is your public key. Uh. Put a minus here, that's just for technical reasons. So you have this uniform random element, and then this thing looks exactly like the second part of the learning with errors samples. So the public key is just one of these, which means it's just a set, it's a, yeah, it's a sequence of two polynomials. Uh, so in our setting, this could look like this. We sample these two small elements, S and E. We sample a uniform random element, A1. And then we compute this A1 times S with a polynomial multiplication modulo Q modulo X to the 8 plus 1. And this gives us an element A0 here. So the public key now looks like this. It's two elements from that ring. So now if you want to encrypt something, we need to yeah, put a message somewhere. Yeah? We need to encode a message in terms of 
uh, of these ring elements, and that's how we do it, for example. So you could, so the message space will be something like that construction with Q we had, so the ring we are working in, but now we take that modulo T instead of modulo Q. Uh, so for example, if we take T equals two, um, we would choose messages which are polynomials of degree at most seven in our case, and which have just zeros or ones as coefficients. And then we can encode n bits at once. So for example, this message goes into this polynomial. And the homomorphic operations we will see later on are homomorphic with respect to the operations in this. Uh, so that, that's a bit weird for mathematicians. We just view this as a sub uh, set of the ring RQ or as a sub-ring. Um, and then the homomorphic operations are the multiplication and addition inside of this. Is it possible to code uh, to encrypt a single bit at a time? Oh, yes. You can just put the bit in the la last coefficient, for example. Mm -hmm. do the decryption from observing the computation even though it's all encrypted. How? Well, it's like the, um, sort of like the old riddle of a person who's two people, one of whom always lies and one of whom always tells the truth. If I've got, um, if I can observe, if a bit is always encrypted to give the same value because it's using the same key, um, I can and I know what the computation is being performed is, whether it's or or and, I can build up the truth table and work out what the original uh, bits must have been. Encryption is always hand So if you encrypt the bits, you always get the different, you get different size of text every time. So it shouldn't. Right, even though, even though you're using the same key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's like comparison? Yeah, that's a bit hard right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there are some algorithms, some deterministic algorithms that do a com bit comparison, uh, that do comparison of two numbers, right? Um, but you have to decompose it bitwise and do the bitwise operations. But it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And then the encryption. And here you can see it's randomized because for each encryption you will sample new elements from uh, the, the error distribution. So take the public key and the message in the sh form of a polynomial. And then you, yeah, produce more of these LWE sample like elements. Uh, you take the A0, multiply it with, with a new um, secret element here, U, and then add some multiple of an error. And here you hide the message. You hide the message in there by adding it. 
adding this polynomial to, to this LWE sample element. And you transport the, the randomness in that second element. Yeah? So example again, so these are three new um, small elements. So for each message you get, you will generate three of those. Um, you take the public key we had. If you take the, the elements we had before, you will end up with this polynomial here. And this looks like a random polynomial. And the second one, C1, is here. So your ciphertext is of that size. So if you want to put a single bit, for example, which some applications might need you to do, have just a single bit in a, in a ciphertext, you will blow up one bit to something that looks like this. And the, the numbers we're talking here for real applications are much, much larger. So that gets huge. So now how do you decrypt? Um, you get a ciphertext, which has two such polynomials. And you have the secret key S, which is also such a polynomial. Um, what you do to decrypt is you compute this polynomial here. Now you multiply C1 with S, you add it to C0. And then you do a modulo T operation. And here it is essential that you had it in uh, symmetric representation, modulo Q. Uh, if you don't do that, you will end up with the wrong message here doing computations modulo 2, for example. Yeah? What happens if you add two numbers, modulo Q, and they, so if you take two numbers, add them, and they are larger than Q, what you do is you reduce it by subtracting Q once. So if the sum was even before, it gets odd afterwards. So you flip bits by these reductions. So you have to be careful with that. If you put it to the minus, so if you put it in the symmetric representation, it keeps its parity. So that's very important here. So why does this work? Look at this. I mean, we plug in the formulas for the polynomial C0, C1. And then you see the minus A1S times U cancels out here with this one. And what remains is the message plus T times some combination of small polynomials. Yeah? So the point now is if, you, if this is small enough and you don't get these reductions, modulo Q, then taking something modulo, modulo T will give you back the, the message here. Yeah? So taking modulo T and assuming that this error is small and nothing weird happened by reducing modulo Q, you can get back the message by reducing modulo T. Yeah, so in the example, okay. Um, yeah, you take the ciphertext and do these computations. And then you can see here that that works. I'm a bit cheating here, not all of the, so if you really do random elements with these parameters, it doesn't work all the time. Yeah, so I chose something that works. Um, because the error is, the parameters are not chosen uh, correctly. The error would, we would have to choose the error so small that it, all of the coefficients would be zero here to get the correct result all the time. Um, so you have to make Q much, much larger. Okay, so we haven't seen any homomorphic operations yet. So we want to add messages inside the encryption. And that's just simply done by adding the polynomials in the ciphertext. So we have two ciphertexts encrypting messages M and M prime. And if you add them coefficient wise, what happens is that these small elements add up here and the errors add up here, the messages add up. So this looks exactly like a ciphertext that encrypts the sum of the messages. Now multiplication is a bit more complicated. Um, so you remember, if you compute C0 plus C1 times S, you get this message plus T times the small things. Um, now we want to preserve this. So we want to have a polynomial which we, where we plug in S, we get back message plus T times small error terms. And this is done in this way. If you just multiply these polynomials, if you plug in S here for X, 
you get back m plus t times something. It's, it's down here. Yeah? And here you get m prime time plus t times something. And if you multiply that out, you get m times m prime plus t times a bunch of things, where the largest error term is the product of those. Yeah? So messages are also very small elements. So these m times these things are not as large as the product of the two error terms here. And here you can see what happens. Yeah? So the, the operations are directly reflected in the error operations. Yeah? So errors add up here, errors multiply down here. Otherwise, these operations are kind of simple. Yeah? It's just addition. Here are a few multiplications, OK. Um, but you might have noticed that now the new ciphertext here has three elements. It isn't of the same form as before. Yeah? So we, get a, we have to generalize the notion of ciphertext. We have to take longer ciphertext as well. Yeah? So now we have three elements. Now, just summarizing what I already said. And you can, if we generalize the, our ciphertext to longer sequences of polynomials, then encryption works as before. You have this polynomial given by these, and you plug in S here, and you get back something M tilde mod T. Yeah, so when we do operations, the ciphertext increase. Then, of course, it gets... Uh, more complicated to do more operations because now adding involves more coefficients and multiplication involves more coefficients. So it might be good to reduce this back to smaller ciphertext again. And there's a way of doing, it, uh, doing this. That's similar to this uh, um, bootstrapping thing somehow. Um, what you do is you encrypt, you somehow encrypt parts of your uh, power of your secret key. You encrypt this S squared here um, with, a, with a power of T in front. That's not really an encryption because it's not in that RT. It's not a proper message here. But it looks like an encryption of powers of T times S squared. And what you can do now is you build up your, you build up this C2 times S squared, this thing. You want to get rid of this. You want to move that inside here to get two elements in the ciphertext again. So you can build up this element homomorphically by using yeah, these public homomorphism keys. And that's a computation. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, so um, it works. You can, what you do is you, you homomorphically subtract that C2S squared thing from the, from the ciphertext, and you get back to a new ciphertext that only has two polynomials. But you pay, of course, by uh, a higher error that's contained in, in, in these things. Yeah? So the errors here sum up again. Um, so that makes it worse. Yeah? If you want to do that operation, you have to cut down on other operations um, because that increases the error as well. OK, so just to, to wrap up, if you want to do that in practice, if you want to, yeah get someone to use the scheme, you have to make a convincing argument that this is secure, which is, I think, not possible for these kind of things right now. But, okay, how, how do you do that? You have to assess the security of the scheme against attacks against your scheme. Yeah? So you look at certain, you look at the best known attacks you have, and you try to estimate the running time of an algorithm that carries out the attack. Um, so if you so we have certain uh, restrictions on our parameters. Yeah? As you might have guessed by now, that the Q must be large enough compa in comparison to T, so the error terms don't overflow, don't get reduced modulo Q. Yeah? Also, um, if you do more additions and more multiplications, you'll have to allow for more errors. So Q has to have a certain size, depending on the number of operations you want to do. This is for the scheme to work correctly. Otherwise, you don't get back the result of by decrypting. Um, and then for security reasons, you have to look at these attacks. Um, so we, we just picked one particular attack um, and yeah, estimated the parameters based on this paper by Lindner and Pikert, which 
does include a certain number of assumptions which might not even be fully true. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to really assess security here. But for the state of the affairs right now, what comes out of this is the following size of parameters. So if you look at this um, column here, that gives you the runtime of the algorithm. So that's security in bits. So an algorithm uh, against these parameters here, for example, would take 2 to the 134 steps. Yeah. So right now in crypto, people usually go for at least 128 bits of security. So that's what we roughly aimed at getting something in that area. This is the number, so that's the degree of the polynomials we want to evaluate. So d minus 1 is the number of multiplications we want to do. So here, if you have 1, then you're doing no multiplications at all. For 2, you, have, you are allowed to do one multiplication. Then you have a certain number of additions, which are not in the table here. And this is the, de uh, the, the degree of the polynomials. Uh, it must be a power of 2. Uh, so this is pretty large here. Yeah? So you have huge polynomials. Then this is the bit size of the prime Q. So it's not 97, but if you want to do two multiplications, you will have to work with 64-bit primes. So every coefficient in your polynomial has 64 bits. So this is the size in 1,000 bits of elements from the ring RQ. And this is the size of the homomorphism key that you use you, you would have to use to do this uh, degree reduction step for the ciphertext to get back to two elements. So just a few words on uh, message encoding. Imagine you want to do integer operations. You want to compute the mean of integers or something. You want to add integers. How do you map them into the polynomials? Now you can put bits into the coefficients. And then what you want to achieve is if you add, if you do these homomorphic addition operations, of course you want to have the addition, the sum of the integers in the end. So you would have to carry, take carries in the, it's not the same as addition modulo 2. So this is kind of some, these are kind of some ugly tricks to, to get that to work. So you don't take t equals 2, you take a larger t, you put in your integers as bits, and then you can add, um, so you always add uh, ones and zeros, but you don't do reduction, so you keep building them up, and in the end you can plug in two into that polynomial you have and get, and get back the integer. But you have to make sure that you don't get reductions modulo t, because that's what happens when you do the homomorphic operations. So you choose t large, which makes your parameters larger. And the same works for multiplication. Um, integer multiplication is not the same as putting bits into your polynomials and then using polynomial multiplication. It's only the same if you don't do reductions modulo uh, x to the 8 plus 1 in our example. Uh, so you have to take smaller degree polynomials for encoding your message. So, yeah, so more or less the statement in our paper was we have this uh, reference implementation that does a few things, um, and it's not really optimized. Yeah? It's just a computer algebra system we used for the polynomial arithmetic. There's a lot of potential to improve that uh, by using the Fourier transform tricks I referred to in the, in the beginning, so discrete Fourier transform. We are not using that, just... Uh, taking the built-in polynomial arithmetic, which is not that bad, actually. Um, and the main cost, as you might have seen, is just polynomial multiplication. Yeah, that's the most expensive uh, we do. So the result is, you can see here. So if you take, for example, you want to do two multiplications, you take this set of parameters. Um, that sampling from the error distribution in milliseconds that's an encryption with pre-computation. You can see that doesn't include any samplings here. So you can pre-sample all these small elements and then use them once you do the actual encryption. So we have like 29 milliseconds for an encryption. 
Of course, decryption depends on the degree. If you have a degree two, you have to do more uh, computation, so that's more expensive here. And a multiplication operation takes 56 milliseconds. And now the last column, you can see that's the price for degree reduction of ciphertext. If you go back from three elements to two, and this is in seconds, not in milliseconds, yeah. So you want to avoid that, actually. So you can live with increasing ciphertext up to a certain size. Maybe it's a trade-off. Uh, what do you want to achieve? I mean, these numbers, milliseconds, already look much better in terms of cryptography than seconds and minutes. Um, yeah. And here's a few examples if you want to compute them. the mean of 100 numbers of size 128 using the first set of parameters because we don't want to do multiplications here. That takes less than 20 milliseconds. And sum and sum of squares, squares to compute mean and variance, something like that. That requires you already have the 100 ciphertext sitting there, and then you compute uh, these operations. OK, thank you. That's it.